You're listening to the Rent Roll Radio Show with Sterling Chapman. Hey, Rent Roll Radio listeners, welcome back to the show. As always, I'm your host, Sterling Chapman. Today, we are joined by Charles Dobbins. He is the uh, multifamilyattorney.com guy, and he is the founder of Multifamily Investing Academy. Charles, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Charles, can you give us a little bit of background about uh, how you got into real estate, what you were doing before, what that transition looked like? Sure. So I, I got out of college. I went in the insurance business, worst business in the world to be in. And uh, knew <laughs> likewise, that I, did exactly, that. <laughs> yeah. You know what I say is that if you have a kid that comes home and says, "Dad, I want to be in the insurance business," there's something wrong with that kid. <laughs> and uh, you know, but my father was in the insurance business, so I couldn't really say that, and he wouldn't tell me otherwise. <laughs> and uh, he was good at it. I wasn't any good at it. And um, I decided I was going to go to law school. And then while while I was in law school, I I started a benefits administration company and uh, and worst job in the world, worst business in the world. I did that for 10 years. I had, you know, 35 employees working for me and uh, I was working harder than anybody else, making no money, uh, even though all my employees went home with a paycheck every single week. Um, and I told my wife, I said, if I don't get out of this, I'm going to be dead at an early age and miserable. Uh, I got to do something. She said, what do you want to do? I said, I've always wanted to own apartments. And uh, so... She says, let's sell the business and let's start buying apartments. And that's what we did. That was pre-last crash. I think that was about 2004. I you know, owned uh, you know, close to 1,000 apartment units, uh, $20 million in property all over the country. And uh, then the market crashed. And I kept some of the properties. I lost some of the properties. And I um, realized at the time that uh, some of my, my friends that I'd made in this business, uh, they were going through the same problems I was going through. And they said, Hey, can you represent us as our attorney to help us through this process? And I said, yeah, sure. Absolutely. No problem. And I realized that, that Sterling, there was nothing I could do for them. I mean, it was the, what was going to happen to their properties was a foregone conclusion. And, uh, all I could do was kind of make the, make the hard landing a little softer by, you know, prepping them for what's going to happen with the lenders and what have you. So I realized then that my my talents are best served by helping investors before they get into the pro- into the properties, helping them understand what they're getting themselves into, protecting them every step of the way, and that's when I started the Multifamily Investing Academy. And uh, you know, I really treat it like it's a law firm. Though I tell my students, I'm a lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. You will hire a lawyer, but I always look out for their best interests. I always act as a fiduciary and making sure that they're doing everything correctly. And uh, and I tell you, certainly, I've been doing this close to ten years now. I I absolutely love it. I, you know, bought more property, but helped more people get into properties, and uh, really made sure that they uh, they knew exactly what they were doing. So that's 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 my, that's my little uh, you know elevator speech. I think we're about on the twelfth floor by now. <laughs> so uh, yeah, absolutely. So you said you're a real estate attorney, yeah. and but but you know we were talking before the show, and you're not a securities attorney, so you're not you know like when. When we syndicate a property, we'd go to a securities attorney and he put together our syndication docs, and that's not what you do. So no. what exactly is it that you do from a law perspective right. when it comes so to real what, estate? Well, first off, from a law perspective, I don't do anything. Technically speaking, uh, I, the, you know, the Bar Association requires me to let new students know that I am a lawyer. I am not your lawyer. You will hire a lawyer. But nevertheless, I provide you with all the template documents, the, the letter of intent. I, I, you do not send out anything. And this is speaking on behalf of my clients. You do not send out anything unless I've, I've proofread it, made sure everything uh, works. We use my purchase and sale agreement to protect you. It's, uh, I developed it over years of, of knowing how my students get screwed and making sure that they don't anymore. And so we use my purchase and sale agreement and we turn it over to your attorney so that they can give its blessing. Because I'll tell you right now, my, my uh, purchase and sale contract is not valid in all 50 states. It is, you've got to um, understand the laws in your a particular marketplace. Uh, and then a local attorney needs to, needs to add some provisions to protect you. So that's, uh, those are some of the things that I do. I help, you know, I, I talk with my students uh, and their brokers. You know, we talk to the owners. Uh, you know, I help put together the whole package, the syndic- not the syndication, but the, the uh, purchase group, um, you know, with other students in mind to make sure that you, you're going to qualify for financing. But once you get through the due diligence process 
and you're ready to pull the trigger on this deal and you know you're going to syndicate it, that's when we turn over everything to the syndication attorney and they handle that aspect of it. I don't get involved in the raising of money. I help my students find the money. I show that I, you know, I will send out emails, uh, blast emails on behalf of my students uh, to help them raise money, but I don't get involved in the raising of money whatsoever or draft any of the securities documents. Not a chance. So I really just handle the trend the transa- transactional side of the equation, um, making sure that from the first offer you make, you're sailing right through to the closing table and everything's going to be taken care of for you. That's how I do it. Awesome. So yeah. what do you, what does your typical student look like and w- what are you training them to do exactly? So, you know, I, I, I guess that the question might not, make a lot of sense, but from, from being around the industry and a lot of people with a lot of different coaching and, and types of programs like that, you know, some people say, well, you need to start small and go get you two duplexes and this is how you do it. And this is the market you look for. And these are the mom and pops you call. And other people are saying, oh, well, you know, you need to go find you a hundred plus unit and you need to syndicate it. Yeah. Yeah. Go big or go home and, and, you know, find the brokers and they're going to be your ticket or so what is your, what is your shtick, you know, for lack of a better word. (laughs) My shtick. Um, Okay. My shtick is, Whatever's right for you, we're going to do for you. If you're not comfortable doing 150 units, then we're not doing that. If you don't want to have partners and we get, you got $100,000 in the bank, okay, then we're going to figure out how we're going to do it on that side. I teach students that, listen, if you want to own 1,000 apartment units in five years, all you got to do is buy 20 in the next 12 months. That's all you got to do. And then we're going to double what you own without selling anything over the next five years. And within five years, you'll own a thousand apartments. It's that simple. But you don't have to start big. You don't have to start with quads. You know, it's what's ever right for you. And what's also uh, important is that we do it in a market that you, I, I, I always ask the question, where do you want to be in five years? And that's going to help determine which market you're going to be in. And choosing the right market in, right out of the gate is the best thing to do. You, you have to do that and you have to know what to be looking for. But overall, the best thing that I do for my students is I teach them that you're building a business. You're never going to get to a thousand units by buying one transaction. It's building a portfolio of multifamily properties. And in order, in order to do that, you've got to have systems in place that get out there and help you run that property and buy more without eating you alive. And that's really what I do because I've, I've been through that myself. Sure. So what is, your, what is your recommended acquisition system look like? Okay. Making offers every week at least one offer a week. If you're not making offers, this is nothing more than an expensive hobby. The only thing that you can control in this business is the making of offers. You can't control the bank saying yes. You can't control the owner saying yes. The only thing you can control in your business is the making of offers. So you have to make sure that you're making offers and you're making offers on a regular basis because this is a sales and marketing business. You know, no matter what you look at it, you have to be out there asking people to buy your product. And that's what the offer is. You're at, you know, you're like a salesman, you're selling offers. And one, the first sale you make in this business is an accepted offer. So that's that's the first part about it is getting out there and, and making offers, but also having the systems in place to build up the, the database of owners in your marketplace and the database of investors that know, like, and trust you. And you do that over, over time. Like, like what you're doing here, Sterling, with a podcast, it builds up credibility for you. And, you know, people, if they want to find out more about you, they just need to come to the podcast. And so having those types of, of marketing advantages uh, uh, in your favor are going to help you every step of the way in the business. You know, it's so funny that you say that because, you know, uh, most, I think we've, we're over a hundred episodes now. And uh, I don't know that anybody that's listened to all the episodes really knows much about me because the, the show has always been about me interviewing the guest. Yeah. Well, that's funny you say, because my best cut, my best, the guy who listens to my podcast doesn't miss one is my brother. I'm like, well, he's a college professor. He's not looking to buy apartments, but he's like my best, my best fan. He tells me all the things they do right and I do wrong on my podcast. But uh, no, but you, you'd be surprised, O'Sterling. It does give you credibility. 
even if they don't not, they can find out more about you in other places. You and I can do a, a do a podcast swap where I get to interview you. You can take my podcast and put it on your website. But you know, it people it does work. I'm I'm totally serious. It, it makes a big difference. They just get to know who you are, and they feel like they can pick up the phone and call you, which is what you want them to what what you want them to do. Absolutely. So your your typical acquisition method is through broker relationships and making several um, offers on on market deals. Is that your typical go to? Oh, oh no, I, I don't. I, mean, I don't like working with brokers. They're uh, they're okay. necessarily evil. You have to work with them, but I prefer to go directly to the owners. And, and how do uh, you how do you do that? Okay. First off, let me give you the concept behind this so people can understand this. The most important aspect of your business is to understand it's sales and marketing. You've got to get out there and find your potential customers before your competition does. And you know that your, your potential customers are the owners of the property. So you got to go to them directly. So many people starting out in this business... Uh, give that task away, delegate that task to somebody that they just met over the phone. Barely speaks that, English. <laughs> uh, yeah, apparently that, that has no allegiance to them, that owes them nothing, that they don't pay, that a hundred other people are asking this, this person for the exact same thing. And that's what a broker does. So if you think that you're going to build your business by just letting somebody oh, like that run it. I wasn't talking about brokers. I was talking about virtual assistants. A oh. lot of people, a lot of people are paying virtual assistants to, to call. Do this work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. This is your job. <laughs> this is your most important aspect. Yeah. No, I think, wow, where are those, where are those foreign language speaking? <laughs> I was thinking. So, but listen, so many people delegate the most important aspect of this business to somebody that doesn't work for them. They don't pay as a hundred other people asking them for the same thing. You, you're never going to survive. If, if that's, you're just going to sit back and wait for this guy to bring you a deal. Mm-hmm. You got to get out there and do it yourself. And the easiest way to do it is just go to the assessor's office, download a database, all assessor's offices, except for one or two that I've bumped into, have the ability for you to download uh, the, the property, the, all the information. Um, and then you, you, know, you just screen it for the type of multifamily property you're looking for, five plus units, 20 plus units. And then Sterling, every single month, you ask that database of those people to, to buy your offer. And sooner or later, one of them is going to say yes. No broker involved, direct to the owner, off-market deal. That's how you're going to build this business, especially in today's market where it's so challenging to find good deals. Isn't it? Yep. And then what is your uh, what is your funding process? So it sounds like you know, when it comes to your coaching program, you, you know, you're kind of all over the place, whether, you know, whether they want to self fund or they need to syndicate, what is your, you know, what is your typical go-to process look like for, for that part of this? Well, it really depends upon the student. I have some students that can self fund. I have some students that don't have a dime to their name, uh, you know, but we got to be real about that. And, you know, I, all the properties I have ever purchased, I have purchased with no money down. That does not mean that I didn't. I showed up at the closing table with with no money. I always showed up with a down payment. It was just someone else's money. And so early on, you need to figure out how do you want to build this business? Can you do it on your own? You, some clients don't want to have anything to do with partners. Some clients said, I don't have any money. I've got to go out and syndicate the deal and raise all the money from somebody else. You've got to figure that out early on. When I think about... Um, uh, I teach my students, when you look at a property, there are two questions you have to have answers for. Number one is, what is my exit strategy? And number two is, how am I going to get this deal financed? And you need to have an answer on that. How do, how do I get that uh, my deal financed? Because that ties right into what kind of capital am I going to need? What type of equity am I going to need? How am I going to build my capital stack on this particular property? So those are some of the things that I always want to make sure that my students are thinking about from day one. I say, you know, as much as you're looking for property, you got to be looking for money. Every time you ask somebody, ask, you know, uh, put out an offer, you should have spoken to at least three other potential investors uh, and start building your database. So you said from your, your story 
that you went from being a business owner to buying apartments to, and are you were you just speeding your way through the story or did you really skip over and not deal with single family or small multifamily at all or we we started out my wife and me we started out looking at single family fix and flips it never felt comfortable for us it never felt i thought i thought single family was a lot riskier than than multifamily i you know the, i you know the area that i that i uh, raised my kids sterling very affluent area i mean you can't buy land there for less than three hundred fifty thousand dollars. you know i hear the stories about people buying properties for thirty thousand dollars putting on, on credit cards you can't do that in my neck of the woods so I never felt comfortable on the single family side. I own my own business. I looked at financial statements every single month on my business. My wife has her MBA. She knows how to run businesses. So, so getting into multifamily was the easiest way for us, the way we looked at it. Like that's the type of business we want to be in. Multifamily is the most logical business there is. It makes total sense. There's no emotion involved. It's based upon a formula, you know, and, and it's just even the, the economic side of multifamily economics is just so logical. It, it just makes total sense to me. So I always look, felt comfortable in, in, uh, on, the, on the multifamily side. If, if you don't want to, that's fine. But w- would you mind walking us through one of your favorite deals? And, and I, I want, and I'm getting, I'm getting personal here. Oh yeah, no, I want to know. Cool. I want to know how much you made off of it, how much you made off of it, what percent, you know, because a lot of times people throw numbers around and, and, and there it's, you know, a lot of times it's just for marketing purposes. I got 10,000 doors or, you know what I mean? And they, they invested partially passively in somebody's 500 unit, you know what I mean? So, So I don't, I don't, I don't give into all that hype. I want to know, like, how did this deal directly impact your life? Like we syndicated it. My portion of it was, you know, 20% as the general partner. I did this. And then when we exited, you know, that was my piece. And that's how that transaction impacted my, yeah. my, my, my life financially. Okay. So this is going to be kind of a long story because I'm going to talk about two transactions, but the, I love the way you, you set this up because I see that so often, especially when people are trying to get on my podcast, you know, like, Hey, I, I you know, I'm, I own 4,000 apartment units. Okay. How many of those 4,000 units did you actually walk through the units and do the due diligence and help to, to negotiate the terms with the lender? Or did you just throw like $25,000 of your IRA in there and say, I now own 4,000 units. <laughs> I mean, Listen, from a legal standpoint, when they tell you they own 4,000 units, that is legally correct. They do. All right. So you can't take that away from them. But understanding what part they played in the whole transaction is key. I mean, and here's the thing is in all the deals that we did, I was the GP. So I did them all. Uh, so, I, you know, I put the whole thing together from soup to nuts. So let's talk about the first one that we, we did. We were looking in the Cincinnati area. And uh, I mean, I was out there every single day looking at deals. And we met a broker, nice lady, Eleanor. Eleanor was her name. I cannot remember her last name. And she said, listen, I know what you guys are looking for. When I find it, get your checkbook ready. Okay, that sounds good to us. Two months later, we get the call from Eleanor. I found you the property. It's located in Michigan, which is good because we had a lot of friends and family in Michigan. Come on up and take a look at it. So we flew out there the next day or so. It was a 128 unit property. This is our first deal. 120 units. I'm not. T- I'm not kidding you, silly. When I tell you, I was looking for 20. That was going to be my first. I was just looking for 20. So she brings us to the 128 unit deal. And we said, okay, uh, that's a little bit more than we were expecting, but is there any way we can kind of carve off part of the deal and buy just part of it? Because there were 40 units in the back that were new, that were more class A properties. And we could do 40. We could figure out how we're going to do 40 and we'll just buy that 40. And they go, go to the seller and the seller says, yep, I'll sell you those 40. Okay. That means there are 78 or 88 that we're not buying. So we put together the deal for the, for the 40. All right. It is originally, now this is going to get 
a little bit technical, but I think the people that are really needing to understand this, they'll appreciate my how how minutia I how minute I get here. When we put the deal together initially, my wife and I thought that because the returns were so good, we could sell off only 50% of the deal and we would keep the other 50. So all of our investors would put up, it was about $600,000, put up $600,000 and we would own 50% of the deal. And for the 600,000, they would own uh, six, uh, 50% of 50%. the deal. Yeah. We did that for a little while and um, we realized pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. And for us to raise that kind of money, they don't like seeing that we're getting 50% for nothing. So we had to pare it back just for optics. So we ended up doing 25% and selling off 75% of the deal for that same $600,000. And I'm not going to mention any names or affiliations, but there was one particular party that asked a question that was it 20 years later now, Sterling is bugging the crap, <laughs> still bugs the crap. Right? She didn't ask what kind of cash on cash return the property generated. She looked me and, at me and said, what are you getting out of the deal? Okay, you know what? I should have fired her right then and there and said, that you're not the kind of investor I want to work with. Absolutely. It's not about what I'm making. It's about what the property is generating, what you're going to earn on this, on this particular deal. So we put that deal together in about nine days. Uh, we raised the $600,000 in about nine days. And let me tell you that. Let me tell people the, the trick. We didn't put it together in nine days. The money was asked for and came all together in nine days. It took us six months of building our database and affiliation with our potential investors to get to that point where you could raise money in nine days. Sure. And what I mean by that is, Everything we did in our multifamily tra travel journey, we let those investors know, hey, we made an offer on this particular property. Hey, it didn't get accepted. Hey, we're we, you know, doing the due diligence in this one, but we decided to kill this deal because it's just not going not, not gonna to fly. We ended up, by the time we started, we pulled the trigger and, and got the deal into contract. Nine days later, we had all the money we needed. And so, you know, over time we paid about a, it, it was, we were paying about a 9% monthly preferred return and Sterling, I do not recommend ever monthly, monthly distribution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you can tell it was my first deal. Sure. Okay. So we buy this property on the 40 about two weeks later, I get a phone call from our bank that happened to hold the note on the other 88 units. And they said, hey, um, how would you like to own the other 88 units? And I said, oh, you know, we use all friends and family to raise money for this one. I don't think I have any friends and family left that have any money. We've kind of tapped them out. And she says, well, what's it going to take to, you know, get you into this deal? I said, we're probably going to need to raise about, about $750,000 uh, for the other 88. And she goes, hmm, okay, uh, what if we lent you the money? And I said, wait a minute, let me see if I understand this correctly. You're going to sell me the 88 units and I am not going to have to come up with any money. She goes, nope, nope, you're going you're gonna, to um, own it yourself. I said, where do I sign? And so within about eight to nine months of me being in the multifamily business, I owned 128 units. But one of the things I teach now, Sterling, is doing your deals the right way. And the, the 40 unit deal, I did the right way. The 88 units, I did the wrong way. And the, <laughs> the, the real reason is because you have to understand you're building a business. All business requires cash. When a cash is out of, when a business is out of cash, it's out of business. And I capitalized the 40 units correctly. We raised about 30% down. I, and that thing cash flowed every single day. On the on the um, forty on the eighty eight units, 80, yeah. I broke even barely every month. 
mm-hmm. because I had put too much debt on the back of that property. It did not run as a good business. And then the market crashed and, you know, it, we went, believe me, we learned an awful lot during that period. We, we eked out of the 88 units when we finally sold it without making a dime ever making a dime. That's why I said it wasn't even worth our effort uh, for the time that we held it. Uh, the 40 units, we, we got a, a respectable return. I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Uh, it was a good property. Hate to see it go, but we, you know, we had to move on from that, that deal. And uh, so that was kind of how our first deal went down. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. That, that that's, a, that's a hell of a story. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I've, I've done the same thing on, you know, on over leveraging and seller financing. And it's yep. like, you know, you know, typically if, if you can, you know, everybody, all these gurus come out and sell and all, no money down and, and you get the seller to finance and carry the extra note. And, and in my experience, like I, the, you know, when I was brand new and some, and I was able to get properties with zero money down, like not even, not none of my money, but like no money, you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. full yep. thing is debt, seller finance. That, yep. they, I've never made anything off of them. Like exactly. I, over, I overpaid, I over leveraged. And I'm yeah. like, I'm like, just cause it's, you know, if, don't if get, a seller don't get caught up in the hype of the buzzwords. Right. If you get a deal that's that seller finance deal, like a hundred percent seller finance, there is something so wrong with that property uh, because that guy <laughs> yeah. will do anything to get that thing off his back and put it on yours. Just oh, yeah. say no. Yeah, Just yeah, say yeah. no. Yeah, that's well, crazy. Awesome. So what advice do you have for uh, people out there looking to get started? Do it. Just yeah. do it. I'm saying like, and be patient, be patient, learn everything you can, make offers, uh, you know, make mistakes, uh, but you got to just do it. Uh, this is the best business in the world to be in. I, I take it from me. I've been in some pretty crappy businesses and this is by far the best business. You, you can make money five different ways on one property. No other business g- generates. Do you want to run through those real quick? Yeah. Um, you've got the, uh, cash on cash return, which is your monthly profit. If you're having a profit, you're having good months, money comes in, you pay all your bills, you get money left over, that's number one. Number two is you get an amortizing note, which means that you're paying down your debt every month. You get 100 people in 100 units that are paying off your note to the bank every single month, and you're not. Um, the other one is forced appreciation. That's how we get rich in this business is we drive the net operating income. And when we do that, we increase the value of the property just by making sure that we're running the business a much better way. And that that's money that you make on this property. Um, acquisition fee, disposition fee. Those are uh, things you talk about in syndication. If you're putting that deal together, you should be paid for, uh, for, for putting that deal together. All the big guys on Wall Street are. You should be too. Uh, disposition fee. Let me tell you, selling a property takes a lot of stuff out of you as well. You should be paid for the, your time in that regard is also. And now, Sterling, this is, I don't know how you're going to feel about this one, but this is what I've learned is once I got to a certain uh, point, I started my own property management company. And the no having way. no way. <laughs> I was going to do that. I was going to do that one time too. And I never went to manage another property. Oh, no, no. My, we did it in such a way uh, that we were total. Ab- we were able to run it uh, from our house in Duxbury and we had staff in all of our properties and we had an accountant who did all the books and everything. And he paid all the bills. He paid the, the payroll. It worked out beautifully. And we got to keep the, uh, the, you know, 5% uh, fee. And that's the nice thing about, about multifamily is, is the 5% fee that provides you with a nice lifestyle, it pays your, your home mortgage, it pays your kids' student loans. It's a great way to make a living. And the, and the forced depreciation and the mortgage pay down and all that other stuff is what makes you a millionaire in this business. The, and, the, uh, arm, the, the mortgage pay down. I, I was, I remember, I don't know where I heard it, but I heard, I like the way somebody worded it. They said, uh, real estate's the only asset class that somebody else will buy for you. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. And yeah. And all of that, you're using somebody else's money to do it. You're using yeah. the bank's money to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I like that. Yep. I thought you were going to say, I thought you were going to say the, the, uh, Harry Helmsley one, you know, the cut, the customers, the clients, the tenants are absolute gold, treat them like they're gold because they get up every morning and bring home a third of their paycheck just to give to you. I said, yeah, <laughs> nice. that's right. Yeah. Yep. 
Well, cool. So I want to hop over to our radio round, just to ask three questions to help our listeners get to know you a little bit better. The All first right. one, and I did not give you a heads up. So if no, you, you have didn't. To and I don't your, appreciate that. I, 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 I always, <laughs> I always, I, I always <laughs> cheated. I always cheated on tests in school. Come uh, on, Sterling. I usually give people a heads up, but I didn't. So, uh, <laughs> so this is the authentic, real deal for all of our oh, listeners. Oh, geez. Okay. Keep, uh, be gentle. The, be gentle. The fir- the, it's easy. The first one is what's your favorite book? Oh, I just, oh man, listen, I got, I don't have a favorite. I've got so many of them. Um, okay. But I let see, me just tell you, is that Paul Moore's book in the back? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Paul, Paul's a great Paul. guy. Paul's, Paul's a great guy. Awesome guy. When I first, uh, did, did you I get first, one of these from Paul? I didn't No, when you I, need to get one of these from Paul. When I first started this podcast, um, I found Paul on, I knew Paul cause I, I watched bigger pockets and all of his seminars yeah. and I read his book, but then I was, I was on some like, Hey, we can find you podcast host or podcast guest.com or something. And he was on there and I sent him an email thinking like, he'll never respond. He replied immediately. He's like, Oh, I'll be on your show. And I was so yeah. like starstruck and, and excited to have him on. And then after I interviewed him, he goes, Oh, do you want other guests? And he introduced me. He sent an email to Gino Barbara. He sent an email to Michael Blanc. He sent an email to all these people like, Oh, y'all should be on Sterling's. So yeah. I love Paul. We've had him on the show twice and I can't yeah. say enough great things about him. I, I totally agree. I've had him on twice too. We've had some great conversations, uh, you know, even talking about health uh, issues and stuff. Uh, I mean, he's just a, a nice man. And I tell you, he and I, we clicked. Uh, we are mm-hmm. of the same mindset, and it was so great talking to him. So yeah, that's Paul, definitely check out Paul Moore for all those people out there. But here, this is another good book, and uh, that um, big shifts ahead. It's a, believe it or not, it's a little dated right now. But the next book out it, that on the same dem, same uh, um, style is the book Twenty Thirty by, by a um, by a um, uh, a Yale professor. Uh, so that's okay. another one. You know, I'm going through also all, all of the uh, Dan Sullivan books right now. I'm in uh, strategic coach. Uh, so all of those things um, uh, will help as well. But I, listen, I could, I could show, I, I do audible. I, I am listening to oh, audible uh, books yeah. all, all day long. Atomic habit, checklist manifesto. Those are all great things to work on. Um, right now I'm getting ready. I'm going to uh, interview a, uh, a congressman who was the a defense attorney for um, uh, the three sale, three seals that were charged with uh, beating up the butcher of Fallujah. Uh, I think it was like oh, wow. the, the jury was out for an hour, found them all not guilty. It was a, a biggest waste of time. And, um, but that's called honor and duty. And that's a great book. I'm going doing that one right now. That's my non-business side, yeah. but I'm actually, turning it into a podcast, which will be great. So, yeah. So the next one is, and this is the one that gives people trouble. What is your favorite quote? Oh, uh, I like the Theodore Roosevelt quote about the man in the man in the uh, man in the arena. You know, you can't find fault with a man in the arena because he's actually out there doing it. Um, Let me think here. Favorite quote. Oh boy. Oh yeah. You needed to give me more time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Cause I, I, uh, I have some great ones that I live by Warren Buffett. I love looking at Warren Buffett's, you know, I love Eleanor Roosevelt's one about, you know, you can't feel insecure. Uh, no one else can make you feel insecure without giving, without you giving them the, your permission. Uh, right. that's another great one. Um, Oh man, Warren Buffett's got some cool ones. You can go on, you know, I sometimes just go on Google just to grab some Warren Buffett uh, quotes. Um, yeah, boy, I, I need it. But I like the Theodore Roosevelt one about the man in, man in the man in the ring or the man in the arena. Um, awesome. That's you should go That'll check that do. one out. Yep. That'll do. Cool. And what's your favorite thing to do outside of work? I play golf and I fly my plane. Um, I, I, uh, Joined my local country club after years of being a caddy, uh, like, you know, poor kid made good. And um, so I, I, I'm, I love to play golf over there. I played yesterday and then I bought two planes and now on my second plane, uh, I love flying. Um, I, I, uh, you know, when I turned 50, I said, you know what, I've always wanted to fly and I'm not going to die without having gotten my pilot's license. So best move I ever made was like, you know what, Man. I'm going to do it. And uh, it, I'll, I'll, uh, let me see what day is today. It's uh, it's a what's it say a Wednesday? Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday. So uh, I'll probably Friday or Saturday. I'll go flying. Uh, I am not. I am not that cool. 
I hear, like, I see guys that are, you know, a lot of guys that run in these like super achiever circles are like, yeah. And then I became a pilot. Yeah. I would be scared shitless. I, I, <laughs> okay. Let me just tell you something. I just, I've been shooting a video here at my studio. So here, the studio has a beautiful uh, sec, a third story deck walkout. Beautiful. Um, I'm trying to use the the backdrop and from uh, for some of the videos I'm shooting. So my my assistant, she's down in Florida. She says, "Hey, what does it look like? Show me your show me stuff out there." So I get out with my camera and I walk out on the deck, and I'm holding holding the camera, showing her around, seeing how beautiful it is where I am, and I'm terrified to be on the deck. I am afraid of heights. Like you can't imagine. I had to get off. Like, this is too scary for me. She goes, are you kidding me? You fly. Yeah, but I'm the pilot and and my plane has a parachute if anything goes wrong. So yeah, I'm not worried about that, but no, I, I, yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. It's, yeah, it's crazy. So how can our listeners get in touch with you, find out more about you, learn about your program? Yeah. So uh, we're, we're starting a new program. It's called Multifamily um, uh, Mastermind. Uh, and it, you can find all, uh, all more about it at the multifamilyinvestingacademy.com. And uh, what it is, is a training program with me for, you know, really, really relatively new people. But the beautiful thing about it is I'm trying to create a network of multifamily investors because I, that's what I've always done is I've always created a venue where my students can all come together and get to know each other. And because a lot of these people, you're not going to do the, these deals on your own. You're going to need partners sure. to help you get across the finish line. And I have never been the type of guy that says, I don't want you talking to my other students. I want my students becoming friends. And I, the whole point behind the mastermind is to create these, these groups where people can get to know other people. You know, I was involved with a guru when I first got started. Started, and he had these these uh, you know emerging market cities. I think I kind of just gave it away who I, who the person was, <laughs> and um, and after about six months he canceled them all, and because the, the students were bad mouthing him and talking about him, saying his programs you know schlocky and what have you. I said when I set up my program, I said I want my students talking to each other forever, and if there's something wrong with my program please tell me. And if there's nothing wrong with my program, go tell everybody else. But I am not going to stand in the way of, of you know, my students uh, communicating with each other to help get across the finish line. And one of the best feelings is when one of my students, who I probably haven't spoken to in a while, comes to me and says, hey, I just did this deal. Oh, man, that's fantastic. How'd you do that deal? It was, oh, I worked with so-and-so. I'm like, wait a minute, so-and-so was also a client of mine. How, how do you know them? Oh, I met them through your program. And then we kept, we hit it off and we started talking. And now we're out there looking for deals. I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I try to accomplish with my programs. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Charles, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure um, our listeners will love it as well. Uh, yeah. We look forward to keeping up with you on your journey. Thanks. I appreciate it, Sterling. It's good to meet you. Thanks for tuning in to the Rent Roll Radio Show brought to you by Crestworth Capital. We hope you enjoyed the show, and if you did, please hit the subscribe button and leave us a rating and review. You can also visit us at CrestworthCapital.com or RentRollRadio.com or follow us on Facebook at RentRollRadio or at Crestworth Capital. If you would like to reach us, feel free to shoot us an email at info at RentRollRadio.com or Sterling at CrestworthCapital.com. We hope you come back next week to join us on some more of our journey. Until then, happy investing.